Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujiwana and today we're going to look at ship classification systems, both in sci-fi and real life, to see if they make any sense. To start with, we should have a look at the most common vessel types you might expect to see in any given space fleet, starting at corvettes. These are the smallest warships that don't drop down into being fighters or bombers or such, if a setting has those. They're typically used for patrols, escort or specialist duties, and corvettes in sci-fi are fairly consistent and line up with real life ones. Frigates are the next step up and tend to have similar roles, but as they are larger, they carry better weapons, defences and other systems. However, things start to get wobbly here, both in sci-fi and real life. Destroyers are where things really go off the rails. They do tend to be larger than frigates and more heavily armed, and capable of doing all sorts of roles. But they can be as big as cruisers, or occasionally very specialised, or sometimes an entirely different type of craft. Cruisers bring things back in line. They are medium to large vessels which can operate off by themselves or as part of a fleet, and are generally the default sort of vessel. Stepping up again, we get to battleships, large, heavily armed and heavily armoured weapons of war. This is where the big guns are, and what entire fleets can be built around. The other big vessels are carriers, which are fairly self-explanatory right up until a setting decides to muddy the waters and slap a massive armament on them for some reason. Going even further up the scale and things go off the rails again, because sci-fi has for some reason ended up with dreadnoughts being these super giga battleship type vessels, often completely dwarfing other ships with their sheer scale, and this is completely mad because the ship they're named after was a type of battleship. A revolutionary one, yes, but still a battleship. Complicating things even further are extra clarifying words like light or heavy, though generally these only add extra steps between the different sizes, so a heavy cruiser would be somewhere between a cruiser and a battleship. But then you add in yet more words like super or fast and uh, So the basic classes seem relatively easy to understand, but they have a lot of crossover in roles, which is made all the more obvious when we plot them all on a graph. This one was made by Winchell Chung over on Atomic Rockets, and is based on a World War II centric definition of spacecraft classes, laying things out depending on their weapons, armour and mobility. Right in the middle are the balanced cruisers, with everything else spread neatly around. But this also demonstrates another of the problems with ship classes. Not only is there overlap between various types, but also a whole lot of subjective positioning. It's also a very purist look at things, coming in from the angle of trying to fit ships into pre-made categories, in a similar manner to the Royal Navy's rating system from the Age of Sail. However, even systems like that were far from perfect. For example, most fourth-rate ships of the line weren't built for that classification, but were instead bigger ships that got cut down or merchantmen that got upgunned. They ended up being fourth rates out of coincidence more than deliberate action. A famous example of the failings of the rating system was the HMS Indefatigable, which used to be a 64-gun third-rate before it was cut down to a 44-gun frigate, pushing it right on the upper limit of being a fifth-rate. At a distance, it looked like a frigate and had the speed of one, but essentially had the armament of a ship of the line. So the rating system said it was one thing, but it acted more as a hybrid of multiple ratings, capable of punching far above its weight. By the way, these details were provided by Dan, the former presenter of this channel, and if you want more Age of Sail vibes, check out the Sojourn audio drama, which applies a lot of 18th century nautical tropes to a sci-fi setting, links in the description. A similar preset system of ship classifications was used in the interwar period, where multiple treaties defined ship types by displacement and armament, while limiting how many could be built. But these treaties didn't apply to everyone who was building ships, and only lasted a few years. So politics also has a tremendous influence on what ships get called what, and sometimes these can get really egregious. For example, Japan's various classes of helicopter destroyer. Due to Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, the JMSDF is not allowed to maintain any offensive military capability, limiting them to destroyers at best. So what they did is make these ships which are called destroyers, while clearly being able to carry all sorts of aircraft, including F-35Bs. The Soviets also pulled similar shenanigans in the 70s with their Kiev-class carriers. These were designated as cruisers so they could pass through the Turkish Straits, which excluded carriers by the 1936 Montreux Convention. The same also applies to the smoke-belching cosmic horror that is the Kuznetsov class, which is especially amusing as China bought one and they deem it a carrier. 
Ship classifications changing between navies isn't a new phenomenon either. Back in the 17th century in the Age of Sail, the French Navy had come up with corvettes, but when the Royal Navy captured them, well, they didn't have corvettes in their system, so the ships were just considered sloops instead. Another modern example is the Horizon Class, a joint project between the French and Italian navies. These are actually counted as a destroyer by the Italians and under NATO classification, but the French consider them to be frigates. Speaking of the NATO system, this by itself has also led to some political silliness. In the 1970s, there was this little thing called the Cold War. You may have heard of it. The Soviet fleet was expanding at the time, particularly in regards to how many cruisers they were building. This scared US politicians because, oh no, the US Navy only had six cruisers to the 19 that the Soviets had. The problem was, this very naive look at classifications completely ignored the size and capability of the actual ships, because the US Navy had many comparable vessels that were simply classified as frigates. So to fix this utterly terrifying cruiser gap between the two navies, the US just reclassified the ships. It doesn't even need to be specific classifications for things to be a bit screwy, as you need look no further than submarines. Unlike their surface dwelling relatives, submarines are all referred to as boats, never as ships. This stems from ye olden times when they were only small auxiliary craft launched from ships, and it just stuck. So irregardless of their size or capability, every sub is a boat, and some can even carry their own boat. So where do all the ships that are boats, frigates that are cruisers, destroyers that are carriers and all that leave us? Uh, well, horribly confused? It's no surprise we get things like the Corvette class frigate when real life is as messy as it is. And if you think about it, this is very freeing if you're making your own ships for your own settings. Real life is full of nonsense and weirdness with ship classifications, so you don't have to be super strict yourself. But real life has reasons for these issues, they're not just daft because no one wants to do it properly. A little bit more world building around why things are the way they are can go a long way, and I've given you some examples you can borrow from, like Mass Effect did with the Treaty of Phyrexion. This was almost certainly based on the Washington Naval Treaty, which also limited how many dreadnoughts various nations could have, but led to an increase in carrier development, just like in Mass Effect. Also, the Quarians in 3 weren't really bound by the treaty, so could convert their live ships to dreadnought equivalents at will. At one point, Admiral Charles Oran also argues that live ships are primarily farms, so they didn't count anyway. Another thing to consider is that the most common sci-fi classifications are very late 20th century centric. Maybe the Age of Sail ratings would be more appropriate to a setting, or perhaps you name your classes by their propulsion systems, or something entirely different. But if you go down those routes, you also have to bear in mind audience expectations, as the whole reason so many settings use similar terms is so people can just instantly understand things and the story can proceed without needing to pause to lay things out. If someone calls out a frigate or a battleship, you know what they mean. So all those ship classifications we see across sci-fi do mean something, but whether they make sense is still up in the air. They probably do, as while they can be messy, the real life inspiration behind them is also fairly messy. So what do you think about it all? Does the Dreadnoughts are giant super ships thing annoy you as much as it annoys me? Let me know in the comments below. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.